Hey, everybody. We've got uh, Jim here from MDS Link, Magic SFB. And we are going to discuss this awesome product, which he took the liberty of bringing to market for us. This is his brain baby that has come onto the market. Quick ad. Today's video has been brought to you by MDS Link, proud creators of the Magic SFP Mocha Adapter. And back we go. And uh, in case you're just tuning in and don't know exactly what I'm talking about, it's this. This magic little device. Ha, see my play on words there? Um, so this is an F-type connector you're seeing on here. This is a Mocha 2.5 SFP transceiver module. And I'm sure that once this hits you in the head like a brick, you're going to realize the potential that it's got and what capabilities it enables you to have, especially when you're looking at an MDU where you cannot run additional cabling or infrastructure. So this is a, a really cool little product. So um, yeah, why don't you introduce yourself and uh, tell us about your awesome product. Thanks, Sarah, for having me today. I appreciate it. So I'm Jim Luciano and I'm the founder of MDS Link. And MDS Link is a uh, small company out of Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, funded by a lot of friends and family, including like the Ben Franklin Technology Partners, which was our first investor. And uh, this was just a, a brainchild that uh, came to us back in like 2017, thought of uh, taking the box concept and shrinking it down into a pluggable as the market was starting to move towards uh, generic uh, white box ethernet solutions. This is a result of just kind of years of being in, in building and seeing what different technologies were being offered to transport data over existing cable, ethernet, fiber, whatever, whatever type of solution it was. Same challenge has always been there uh, back in 2009 when I got involved in it to now, which is at last mile, last 300 feet, 100 feet, whatever it is. And how are you going to get data over uh, from, you know, point A to point B, whether it be an MDF or an IDF into that home? So this is a result of just years of doing it. I know some people are going to be like, well, why don't I just get like a other arm? mocha box and it's just like well you can use those as the endpoints but being able to distribute within a building to many floors that's where this guy really comes in handy right so um as you know we've done the lab for this it's going to be after this this is going to be video one but yeah i mean like so the capabilities actually let me get my adhd brain back on track so by default this is a, a full duplex one gigabit uh transceiver so it'll do one gig in either direction, which essentially means it'll aggregate at about 2.5 gigabits per second, as most one gig connections are 1.25 gigabits per second. Um, but this one also lists that it has the ability to do 2.5 gigabits per, uh, per second. So oh, would you mind clarifying on that a little bit more? Because that's really cool. That's the capability of the chip that we're using. And the chip manufacturer is Max Linear which most people are gonna know who they are uh, because they're the only ones building the Mocha 2.5 chip these days. So uh, with the 2.5, the whole, uh, what do I wanna say? The requirement is the fiber port needs to support 2.5 gig. And if it does, you can get our, we have a different SKU, but you can get the uh, 2.5 version and you can plug it in. You will see somewhere in the neighborhood of probably 2.1 to 2.2 over that piece of coax. Now, these guys here as well. So these guys are backwards compatible then with uh, Mocha 1, Mocha 1.5, all the different Mocha standards as it's using a standard Mocha 2.5 chip, essentially. That's correct. So the, thi the thing to note on that though is it will operate at the lowest frequency on that network. So if you had, let's say you had a network that had the 2.5 plugged in, but then in that network you had Mocha, like a Mocha 1.1, which is running at say 200 meg. And then you had another Mocha 1.1 plus running at, I don't know, 400 meg or whatever it is. It's only gonna, it's only gonna send and receive at that lowest free, at the lowest capability. So if it's 100 meg, it'll transfer at 100 meg, even though we're two five. If it's the 400 meg, that's what it'll transfer at. So you can leverage the existing technology if you want, uh, it's just going to run at those lower speeds. That's all. 
Okay, well, that's understandable. Um, so yeah, I mean, like, so these guys work with them, but of course they'll work at the slowest rate depending on the device that's connected. So if you've got a bunch of Mocha 1 stuff within the building and it connects with these guys, then uh, your Mocha 2.5 stuff is gonna be running at like 400 megs. That's right. a very cool point to have. Um, so now, you, I think you mentioned something about hostless and hosted type devices. Yeah. So uh, in, in the hosted device, a hosted is going to be, uh, it, it, and, there, and you can see those in the marketplace today. There's companies that are building controllers with the same chip that we're using, and they'll have modems at the other end, and that's the hosted. So the hosted will, um, the hosted will give you different capabilities. It'll give you, it'll give you uh, more reporting. It'll give you uh, some additional connections versus what we can do. So because of the image we're using, we are uh, 16 total registries on a connection. Meaning if you plug us one of ours into a switch, you can then connect an additional 15 devices to that one for a total of 16. If you, if you're in a, and we're in a hostless, that's a hostless mode. If you're in a hosted version, you can actually go up to, I believe it's 31 connections. There's 32 total and there'd be 31, but now you're buying a controller. Now, this is not its final form, Dragon Ball Z quote. <laughs> you you mentioned that this thing has been evolving when we were actually in talks there. So this is actually just one of the first steps in the evolution of this device. Uh, where do you see this device going? And like, uh, what kind of little modifications are gonna be happening to it? What kind of stuff can we expect? What's happening with it? So second half of this year, which is pretty close, we're, we're starting to take a look at redesigning the housing. So by redesigning the housing, like right now, if any of your people take the device and plug it in, in some switches we can fit side by side or top and bottom, but in most switches we can't. And so what'll happen is the, uh, the bigger piece of our module at the end will get narrowed down. And so we'll, we'll end up being able to stack and go side by side. That'll be uh, most likely a Q1 next year where we'll be able to deliver that prop. The version you have is a high frequency. So the high frequency we run at 1100 to 1600 megahertz. We also have the capability to do low frequency, which would be between 400 and 700. And, uh, and then in the high frequency, we've also recently locked the two highest frequencies. And the reason we've done that is uh, in, in some instances, uh, people are going to use this where they're going to coexist with, say, a cable operator mm -hmm. that's running DOCSIS. And so by locking the two higher frequencies, we won't get in the way of, of their frequency bands and uh, we won't have to worry about. It's not that we can compete. We wouldn't be able to function uh, if we overlapped into their frequency bands. So it's a way to make sure that uh, the integrators don't have any issues when they plug us in. That was one of the questions I was going to ask, because one of the biggest questions that's been going around is how does this cohabitate and coexist with uh, existing DOCSIS deployments? And um, my answer to those people has been, well, let's take a look at what frequencies each platform uses. Yes. And so this is actually cool. You guys have been thinking about that and you've got that uh, with the intent in your design. So uh, on the coexisting, so how we kind of uh, help with that, um, we have a built-in diplexer we have uh, a, a bandpass filter on the board as well. Um, that helps to uh, keep us away from that, uh, that video signal. And when I say keep us away, we don't touch the video. The vi we actually take the video and we pass it through. We do create loss. So there, there are considerations as you're going in and deploying, if you're deploying and you're coexisting with a cable operator, you'll have to do some meter readings You'll have to make sure that if you're creating too much loss, you may have to actually put a little uh, a little dB amp in, like a little 15 dB amp into that line, so you kind of boost up that signal, and there aren't any issues. But so you just brought up something which actually raises an entirely new question for me, because that's a cool concept. So. What kind of amplifiers is this compatible with? Because I know with DOCSIS, you have to make sure that you're, you've got one that's compliant with the standard that you're gonna amplify. But is, can you pretty much just use any high frequency uh, amplifier with these? As far as an amp goes, so we, I need to be careful about that, okay? Mm -hmm. We can't go through an amplifier. If we go through an amplifier, the MOCO signal is gonna get knocked out. 
So we have to go around it. There's ways to go around that amplifier that are very simple and easy. When I'm talking about the amplifier going in, you would actually take the amplifier at the tap potentially and inject, you'd inject that amp into the into that tap and push it across and it kind of boosts up that video signal. Just a quick check here on Amazon. And there are people who claim to have Mocha amp, uh, amplifiers. Amphenol seems to make one. And the only uh, reason why I bring that up is because when you mentioned that, what would be a very cool model for this? Because already we're discussing, like, I've got lots of guys who want to use these in their MDUs because, you know, oh, I can't get, you know, new infrastructure and I can't run fiber in this building. It's impossible. Oh, it's a heritage right. site. We're not allowed to put anything on the outside of the building. There's so many reasons why utilizing the existing coaxial infrastructure in the building is just awesome and really simplifies the whole solution. But you mentioned that, uh, uh, so let's just say that you've got uh, a large campus or a large grouping of outbuildings per se, like um, industrial or agricultural, right? Uh, this could potentially actually solve a real problem for people because rather than having all sorts of fiber switch gear, if they were to hypothetically to say, pop this into like Microtech or whatever switches at their front office, shoot it over coax, like say whatever length they can squeeze out of it, which I, I tested it at a thousand feet on one spool of RG6 or sorry, two spools of RG6. So that also included 3DB of loss at the joint, right? But if mm -hmm. you can shoot that across one piece of thousand foot coax to one building, bring it into a tap, amplify it and send it on again, you're essentially dropping this. You're creating almost like the original um, 10 base T networks, the old um, coaxial Balin type networks. Uh, Banyan, I think is what it was called, wasn't it? Like the old coax yeah. tap network. Well, you know, you bring that up, and I think in most most of those buildings you're talking about, they probably already have coax. They probably have coax and twisted pair going between the buildings, and uh, and you could do that. Um, in fact, I'm in Europe right now, and a couple of the use cases that are being brought up is uh, fiber to a cabinet, and then from the cabinet, us going into the home so they don't have to trench. The other thing that's really important for people to understand about how we view this market is in, in those scenarios, we would say, hey, if you can pull cable, that's the best way to do it. But if you're in a in a period where you can't pull it or in, in some buildings are going to do, say, uh, a hard, uh, a hard uh, what do you call it, uh, renovation, our product's a really nice way to deliver that bandwidth that you need right now without having to interrupt your current schedule. And then when you go do your hard renovation, you can pull our product out. And the really nice thing about it is there's no configuration. You can take it and throw it in a box and re redeploy it somewhere else. And it's very simple. You don't have to reset anything to default. Now, uh, some of the guys were asking about layer two isolation, but I think that we all know the answer to that one is that this is basically a media converter. There's no intelligence behind it. And the very tiny little bit of intelligence that's in it is essentially for core functionality. And that's it. These aren't necessarily designed to be an intelligent device. They're simply a media converter. But there's a lot of guys that are asking about um, potentially having layer two isolation capable on these things. They aren't currently capable of layer two isolation at all, correct? As of right now, no, they're not. Um, but because of our conversation, I will bring it up with, uh, with our chip manufacturer and then with our technical team as well to see if it's something that can be done. And I can, I can provide you an answer pretty quickly for that. Okay. And as for hardware compatibility, so like I've tested these in quite a few things and I haven't found anything that they don't work in yet. So I wouldn't be too concerned. I think you guys have a winning product here. And I think that, uh, you've covered all the grounds. You've made something wonderful that, uh, Already, a lot of my guys are just like scrambling, like scrambling to get a hold of because I mean, like, I don't need to really reiterate, but MDUs is perfect for MDUs or long yeah. range data where you either don't have the tools for fiber optics or, you know, why bother running fiber when you can do something as simple as this, right? Right, exactly. We're not looking to replace fiber, replace Ethernet. We're a tool that people can use in the same architecture that they're deploying today uh, without having to add any boxes. That's Try to keep it simple like that. So with that being said, are there any other um, devices that you guys are working on? Are you guys working on, is there any cool research you guys are doing that uh, you can share with us today? Well, I, I don't know if I'm ready to share, but we are working on uh, another product that's, uh, so 
We've, we've, we're moving our marketing from last mile connectivity to fiber extension modules. And uh, we, uh, we're, we're looking at uh, a, a module with G.HN in it now, uh, going over a different piece of copper in the building. And that's kind of why we're moving towards fiber extension modules. And I guess what I'd say is hopefully within the next, I don't know, 30, 45 days, we'll be able to announce that product. And, and it should be pretty interesting. It'll cover all the copper in the building at that point. This is good. very cool. Well, thank you for joining us today. And uh, thanks for bringing this brain baby to the market because I can't sure. say it enough. This was needed. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you guys for watching. Don't forget to like and subscribe. If you have any questions, leave them in the comments below. And uh, I'll make sure that uh, I answer them the best I can. Join the Patreon, join the Facebook page, blah, 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 blah. Thanks guys for joining us and uh, have a great day.